2 Peter chapter 3, and we're continuing in 2 Peter, a very heavy book. And uh, you'll notice similarities between chapter 3 and chapter 2. He's continuing, but now he's dealing with scoffers of the last day. And our topic is mockers of the final judgment. And today we're going to look at this morning and this afternoon, we're going to look at ver uh, chapter 3, 1 to 4. And we're not going to quite finish chapter 4, but it's a very profitable section of scripture. I'll read the whole chapter. <clears throat> this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. <clears throat> Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this, they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that should all, but that all should come to repentance. <clears throat> but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we... According to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking of them, in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. after a scathing and terrifying warning against false teachers. Their antinomian scandalous behavior and the consequences of their doctrine in life, and it is a terrifying chapter, Peter turns his attention to a theme closely related to these errorists. A denial of the coming certain day of the Lord when Jesus will come and judge all men The apostle recognizes that a consideration of Christ's second coming is a special means to help believers strive for holiness and perseverance. And as you noticed as we read the chapter, he hammers that theme over and over again. He also recognizes a logical connection between heresy and antinomianism. With the denial of Jesus' literal, bodily, second coming to judge the quick and the dead. People who want to live in sin don't want to face the judgment. So they deny the judgment. Now these people simply deny that the judgment's going to happen. What do people do in our day? Well, they teach that everybody gets to go to heaven. Remember the movie, All Dogs Go to Heaven? Well, in the modern theory, everybody goes to heaven. That's the way people talk. But it's not true. There is a judgment. 
and you better believe in Christ and repent. People, whether rank unbelievers or wicked heretics who live in immorality, deny the second coming of Christ because they reject the fact that there are consequences for sin and immoral living. Remember the gospel. In the gospel, God doesn't simply overlook your sin. He doesn't simply say, well, you said you're sorry, you're okay, as in Judaism and Islam. Jesus paid for your sin in full. So sin is never overlooked. It's either paid for in full by Jesus Christ, or you're going to pay for it yourself in everlasting fire. Moral antinomians seek a supporting eschatology or view of the end. For the libertine, there is no moral accountability at the end of history. Everything simply continues as it did before. In this section, Peter will crush this denial and focus our attention on the certainty of Christ's second coming, the certainty of divine judgment. Well, we begin with a reminder of the truth of special revelation. In the first two verses, Peter calls his audience back to the sacred scriptures or divine revelation as proof of what he is about to say. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which to stir you up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Now, that's the New King James. The King James is almost identical. Some modern translations are slightly different because that Greek sentence in Greek is extremely difficult and bizarre. But this translation is fine, and I'll explain that later. When Peter speaks of the second epistle, Contrary to modernists and others, the first epistle refers to 1 Peter, which was addressed to the same audience at an earlier date. The first epistle, 1 Peter. Modernists speak much of this verse, and many claim that 2 Peter was a forgery, forgery written around AD 125. That's what you're going to learn in a modernist seminary. The foolishness and absurdity of the liberal view can be seen in the fact that some people who were alive when 1 Peter was written would have still been alive in A.D. 125. <clears throat> when the forgery was supposedly passed off as a real among the churches. The problem with this view is that those alive earlier would have known immediately that such a document was something completely new and thus obviously <clears throat> a, uh, would, would have been a forgery, not a true Second Peter. Therefore, Second Peter came from Peter himself. Uh, just by way of analogy, let's say in 1925, some people came forward. Now, there were still men alive from the Civil War. Not a lot, but there were still men alive. And let's say some people came forward and said, well, Abraham Lincoln did A, B, C, and D, and he had done none of those things, and he had written none of these documents. Well, the people alive in 1925 would say, well, that's absurd. We were there. We were witnesses. We were eyewitnesses. You're a liar. That's why modernism is not well thought out, and it's completely unbiblical and foolish. Regarding these verses, we need to note the following. First, note that the apostle directs his attention, <clears throat> his instructions to sanctified or pure minds. The words of Scripture are not applied by the Holy Spirit to unregenerate, darkened minds. Much of what is involved in our sanctification, our growth in grace, your growth in holiness, in maturity as a believer, involves the Holy Spirit bringing to remembrance the teachings of Scripture. And that is why Bible reading, memorization, and meditation are so important. And people say, well, I don't have time. Well, you had time to watch TV. You had time to play your video games. You had time to go out and play pool. Make time for Bible reading and meditation. 
We must use our enlightened minds to study the scripture so that by way of remembrance, we can apply our sanctified understanding to future events, refuting false teachers and fighting off temptations. So here's Peter, writing by divine inspiration. He's got the Holy Spirit in a unique way. He's giving a scripture. And he says, I want to bring, I want to remind you what the Bible has to say, what the scriptures have to say. The apostle's main purpose of writing his epistle is to awaken and rouse the pure minds of the Christians <coughs> to whom he writes to an actual consideration and constant practice of known truths. And this is the main intent of all good gospel preaching to call to mind what has been revealed to us and to apply it to our situation in life. The gospel and the law of God are not complicated things. But because we're, th we're thick-skulled and we're sinners, and Christians are rotten sinners, we need to have this applied to us over and over and over again. The better we understand the word of God, the better we can apply it to our lives and resist temptation. Second, in teaching Christians who reject scoffers, Paul does, uh, excuse me, Peter, does not appeal to autonomous human reason or empiricism, but tra or tradition, human traditions, or church traditions, but solely to the word of God. If one is to come to any conclusion regarding the second coming of Christ and the end of the world, that conclusion must be based solely on the word of God which was spoken clearly upon this issue. Now let us note the Apostles' terminology. We are to call to mind and focus our faith on the Holy Prophets. <clears throat> now in places like Ephesians, the word prophets is used in the sense of New Testament prophets. Here, it's clearly in reference to Old Testament prophets. The prophets use terminology that referred to judgments in history and also use such terminology to refer to the final judgment at the end of history. Here's some expressions used. The day of the Lord. Now I want you to realize that many of these have fulfillments in history, but some refer to the end of history. The crucifixion is referred to as the day of the Lord because it's a judgment on Christ where he bore the sins of his people. Uh, we have the day of the Lord in Acts chapter 2. So the, the, the day of the Lord and these terminology of judgment can be applied to things in history, but all of those things point ultimately to the second coming of Christ. The day of the Lord, Isaiah 2, 12, 13, 6, Jeremiah 13, 5, Ezekiel 30, verse 3, Joel 1, 15, 2, 1, 11, 31, 3, 14, Amos 5, 18, and 20, Zephaniah 1, 15, and 18. The day of vengeance. Proverbs 6, 34, Isaiah 34, 8, and 61, 2. The days of vengeance. That we find that, of course, in Luke 21, 22. And that's uh, referring there to the judgment on Jerusalem. The day of visitation, Isaiah 10, verse 3. The day of evil, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah 17, 17. The day of slaughter, Jeremiah 12, 3. The day of indignation, Ezekiel 22, 24. The day of his coming, Malachi 3, 2. Behold, he is coming, Malachi 3.1. The coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Malachi 4.5. Then, of course, we have the coming on the clouds phraseology. In many places, Isaiah 19, Nahum 1, Mark 14, Matthew 26 and following, some of which refer to Christ's ascension. And we find that, I believe, Daniel 7. Uh, some of them refer, many of them refer to comings in judgment in history. And then, of course, we in Acts chapter 1, and other places, we have that referring to Christ's second bodily coming, where he descends surrounded by the hosts of heaven, the angelic army, armies ready to take vengeance on those who do not know Christ and reject the gospel. All the various judgments in history <coughs> should remind us of the final judgment, the final day of wrath, when evil will be totally eradicated from the earth forever. And then we have some uh, particularly clear passages, Daniel 12, verse 2, listen to this. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Here's Isaiah 26, 19. It's very similar. 
Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust. For your dew is like the dew, is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. And then we have the final judgment by Christ uh, in Job 19, 25 to 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is, skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Can't get any clearer than that. There's going to be a final resurrection. Christ will once again be on the earth, and he's going to see Christ with his own resurrected eyes. And here's Psalm 54 to 5. Here's what Asaph says. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. And then Solomon warned us in Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. <coughs> Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Just a sampling. Yes, the Bible from beginning to end teaches a final judgment. In Greek, Peter here uses the perfect tense for the word spoken to indicate that although these prophecies were uttered in the past, they are valid in the present. Okay, when God utters a prophecy and he inscripturates it, it's there for you to read. It's there for us, and it's still completely valid and applies. Holy prophets spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's from Peter 1.21. Now, Peter designates them holy, which seems to have been a common designation for the Old Testament prophets. For example, in his song, Zechariah says that God spoke through his holy prophets of long ago. That's Luke 1.70. And when Peter preached after the healing of a lame man at the temple, he mentioned that God would restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets, Acts 3.21. The qualification holy differentiates the true prophets of God from those who are false. It discloses that their prophecies have a divine origin. And then Peter goes on to say this, and the commandment of us. <clears throat> by this, he means the whole doctrine of the gospel as preached by himself and the other apostles, which included the glorification of Christ and his return to judge the world. The New Testament teaching of the gospel is not just the bloody cross, but also the empty tomb. Read the book of Acts. They talk about the resurrection over and over and over again. It is not only the suffering and death of Christ whereby the sins of his people were paid for in full, but also his glorification, his kingship. And I mentioned this in other sermons. Go to your concordance, look up the word Lord, and look up the word Savior. Jesus is referred to Lord many, many, many more times in the book of Acts than he is as Savior. Now, yes, he's Savior, but he's also Lord. We need to emphasize that. At the resurrection, Jesus is the divine human mediator. As a divine human mediator, was given all power and authority over heaven and earth. It is his head that he rules and applies redemption to his people. For this reason, Peter uses Jesus' full formal name in this context and three other times in this epistle. The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's his full name, his full title the Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah. Just a side note, what does this tell us right off the bat? Well, it tells us that premillennialism is totally unbiblical. Christ is king now. 
Christ is ruling now. Christ is conquering the nations now. It doesn't await the second coming and a supposed future millennium. The millennium began when Jesus Christ rose from the dead and Satan was chained to the great chain so he could no longer deceive the nations as he once did. That the lordship of Christ is crucial to the gospel is easily seen by the apostolic preaching in the book of Acts. And we're just going to mention a little bit. In his Pentecost Day sermon, Peter concluded his gospel message by saying, this is 236, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. <coughs> Here's what Paul said. Paul's sermon to the Greeks, 1730 to 31. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why now? Why? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed, excuse me, he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising them from the dead. So for Paul, proof of the final judgment, proof that Christ is in charge of the final judgment, and he sits on his white lustrous throne and judges a whole human race, is the resurrection. The resurrection is organically connected to the ascension, to the right hand of God the Father, the rule of Christ at the right hand of God in heaven through history, <clears throat> where he applies redemption to his people, and he punishes the wicked with a rod of iron, and his return in glory, and the final judgment. They're all connected. And Christ's glorification is not complete until he's publicly vindicated before the whole world, believers and unbelievers, on the day of judgment. The resurrection of our Lord is the guarantee, alike, that the risen one possesses the authority and power for his office as judge. Romans 1, 4, John 5, 26 to 27. And that there will be a general resurrection of the dead followed by a righteous judgment, Revelation 20, 11 to 13. <clears throat> the doctrine of the resurrection is basic to the Christian faith. And the final judgment that flows from the resurrection is basic as well. You've got to believe in the final judgment, the second bodily coming of Christ, to be a Christian. If you deny the final bodily coming of Christ in the ju final judgment, you cannot be a Christian. You are a damnable heretic. And that applies to all of you out there who is a full preterist. To deny the one is logically to deny the other. It is noteworthy <clears throat> that the preaching of the gospel is referred to as a commandment. Peter is referring to the apostolic foundation of the church or the gospel in broad terms. What did Jesus tell them? What are his marching orders? Well, Matthew 28, 20. He told them to disciple the nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Everything that Jesus taught and commanded, we are commanded to believe and to follow. Therefore, we are justified in applying this expression to the Lord's commandment to continually be on the lookout for and be ready for his coming to judge the world. Jesus taught on that many, many times. And he taught that he himself will be the final judge. One of the most vivid passages is Matthew 25, where he's the judge and those who do not believe are on the left, those who believe are on the right. And the ones on the right are given paradise, and the ones on the left are cast in the lake of, uh, into everlasting punishment. Now, in the Greek, I mentioned this earlier, the construction of this verse is cumbersome in the extreme, and the New King James does not quite capture the meaning. <clears throat> the idea is not simply that the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ gave the commandment, but that the commandment of the apostles came from the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's reflected in some modern translations that try to paraphrase it and make more sense out of it. Our Lord spoke clearly about a coming day of perfect justice when he would be vindicated publicly and the saints will hear, Come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, Matthew 25, 34. The wicked 
or those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, who are on the glorified Redeemer's left hand, we'll see here, this is Matthew 25, 41. Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This is a doctrine that unbelievers find particularly difficult. And like I said today, you could have the greatest whoremonger in Hollywood or some rock star die, and they interview them at the funeral, and everyone, oh, he was such a wonderful man. He's up in heaven right now looking down upon us. He's up in heaven now. No, he's not. If he didn't believe in Jesus Christ and repent, he's not in heaven. He's in hell awaiting the final judgment. Let's be clear about that. They find the doctrine of the final judgment strangely incredible. Everything about it, they say, seems unfair and fanciful. They say they are quick to set the allies of false teachers and mockers concerning it. Oh, everybody goes to heaven. Well, it's not true. Well, here's Scripture's warning about scoffers. In verse 3, Peter proceeds with a strong warning concerning those, regarding those who deny the second coming of Christ. I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now the expression, know this first, or first of all, is not there to enumerate a list of topics, but to set forth the crucial importance of what Peter is about to say. This is super important. Get this in your skull. God, in his mercy, through the Holy Spirit, warns us about the species of false teachers in the New Covenant era. <clears throat> Love warns us of the dangers ahead of time. And the New Testament is full of warnings about heretics, seducers, false teachers, and those who would seduce us from the full orthodox gospel message. This idea today among modern evangelicals, well, let's not condemn anybody. You know, the Pope's a nice guy. You know, let's just speak positively about people. Let's not say anything negative about false teachers or false doctrine. That's not the New Testament way of doing things. That's not the Holy Spirit's way of doing things, for the Holy Spirit wrote the New Testament. It's stupid and dangerous. The prophetic will come is used to indicate the certainty of this prediction. Now, the time indicator of this occurrence is the last days. This is a very common expression in the New Testament that today is often misunderstood. Now, if you're a dispensationalist in a typical evangelical church, the expression last days means, well, that's just the time or the generation immediately preceding the second coming of Christ. And then they say, you're in the last days. Europe is about to form a confederacy and Antichrist is on the rise and the rapture is about to happen. You're living in the last days. This is the final generation. Well, that's not how it's used in the New Testament at all. That's a terrible mistake. If we look at how this expression is used in the New Testament, we will see that it refers to the New Covenant era, not just the period immediately preceding the second coming of Christ. <coughs> For example... In Hebrews 1, 1 to 2, the appearance of God's Son in the Incarnation indicates the last days. Listen to this. Here's verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, verse 2, has in these last days, okay, that's the days of Paul and Peter and after the Christ rose from the dead, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds. The expression last day, the last days or the latter days occurs a dozen times in the Greek Septuagint in the Old Testament and designates the eschatological time of the Messiah. The author of Hebrews is telling his readers <clears throat> that the Messianic age has arrived. The kingdom of Christ has arrived. The Messianic age is the final age. 
It is the era that follows the Old Covenant era and thus is latter, final, or last. The Mosaic Covenant with the Levitical priesthood and shadow ceremonies has given way to the new order of Messianic reality, which unlike the old is final and permanent because its leadership, its priesthood, and its kingdom belong uniquely to him who is the eternal son. The last age is the Messianic age, the age of Christ, and we're in it. And that's why the old designation developed in the Middle Ages, uh, the early Middle Ages, uh, before Christ, after Christ, B.C., A.D., uh, is quite excellent. After Christ, it's a new epoch of history, and this is the way we should divide all time. When Christ came, begins a whole new age. And Peter basically says the same thing in 1 Peter 1.20. Excuse me. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And then note Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 10 11. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And then in James 5, 3, we read this. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Okay, that applied to his audience. <clears throat> but once again, keep in mind that the expression last days is used in Scripture in regard to the grand sweep of redemptive history. The post-millennial view of the last days is that the last days of the Old Covenant era introduced the great era of historical victory for the Church of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and then that brings us to Peter's main topic here, the scoffing scoffers. The scoffers who scoff. The central warning is against mockers or scoffers who mock the word of God, in particular, the reality of the second coming of Christ. Peter says literally in Greek, mockers in mockery, or mockers who mock. There are a number of things to note regarding these verses. First, <clears throat> the fact that these mockers are make, mocking a doctrine, a doctrinal position of the true Christian religion, indicates <clears throat> that these people are familiar with the word of God. These are not some ignorant pagans out on an island somewhere. These are people who are apostates. They knew God's revelation and they openly reject it as false, as a myth, a fairy tale. And most commentators believe they are part of the same group described in chapter 2. They are wicked apostates who have turned against the faith. To mock the teachings of Scripture is an exceptionally serious sin. <clears throat> to mock the great doctrines of the Bible is to ridicule them. It is to regard them as foolish, wicked, and deceitful. Mocking should not be confused with simply joking around. Jesting depicts frivolity, but scoffing is a sin that is deliberate and it is an act of hostility and hatred. Think of somebody like Bill Maher or modernists. Scoffing occurs when men show willful contempt for God, for his son Jesus Christ in the sacred scriptures. And we live in a culture where mockery of the Bible and Christ and God are common and acceptable. <coughs> Our president mocks the Lord Jesus Christ all the time by his policies. <clears throat> People, cultures, and ch churches that reject Christ in the Bible become obsessed <clears throat> with mocking the truths of Scripture. Modernism, or what's called Christian liberalism, is an apostate form of Christianity that exists on the mockery of Scripture. That's its whole self-justification. 
Creation, the worldwide flood, the fall of man, the miracles, the divinity of Christ, the resurrection and atonement are all rejected as foolish myths. <clears throat> the Christian faith is completely redefined. Higher criticism is nothing but man standing over the scriptures and judging it to be false. They regard it as a creation of backward, primitive tribes and power-hungry priests. And they mock the Bible because they believe it, uh, that they believe that they are scientific, modern, intellectual. But they are blasphemous, wicked fools who reject the truth and unrighteousness. And once again, we must point out that heresy, antinomianism, and the mockery of Christ all flow out of an evil heart of unbelief. Science properly defined, does not disprove the Bible. And we're going to get into this this afternoon when we go into detail uh, if, when Peter refutes them. Science, if you could actually be objective, and of course no one can, we all have presuppositions, but if you could be objective, science proves the word of God. <coughs> the only way that we have a fossil record is the worldwide flood, a giant catastrophe. If you believe in uniformitarianism, which is what scientists teach, they've taught this for a couple hundred years now, and uniformitarianism is what led to the theory, ma theory of macroevolution and Charles Darwin, you don't have a fossil record. If you go to a modern stream and dig it up, or you go to the ocean bed and dig up 30 feet of the ocean bed, you don't find strata and levels with fossils in them. You need a quick burial that takes the animals by surprise. And how do you get that? You, get, you have to have a worldwide flood. If considered objectively, all scientific endeavors would prove the Bible. Paleontology, archaeology, and astronomy only disprove the scriptures when men have unbelieving presuppositions and they impose their unbelieving presuppositions on the facts and twist them <coughs> they have an axe to grind are totally unsubjective, unobjective, and unreliable. They read the facts according to their unbelieving presuppositions. And that is why it is so crucial that we believe the whole Bible. Everything from the creation account of the flood to the history and the miracles must be received as 100% factual and true. And if you don't do that, I guarantee you that you're going to run into error and heresy and unbelief. In fact, you're approaching Scripture with a spirit of unbelief. To trust in Christ involves believing in everything he taught or said. In, in the Gospels, he believed in a literal Adam and Eve and a literal fall. In the Gospels, he believed in a literal Noah and a literal worldwide flood. He believed in a literal devil who tempts people. If you deny the word of God, and if you adopt modernism, or even neo-evangelicalism, which denies much of the teachings of Scripture, you're simply not a Christian. You don't have faith. Once we call into question certain sections of the Bible that we may find difficult or hard to believe, or hard to accept, then we place God's word in the dock and act like Eve, who listened to the devil, who told her that she should not accept God's word as factual until she judged it for herself by using autonomous human reason and autonomous empiricism. And that's what Eve did. The fruit looks nice, looks really good. It doesn't look like it's harmful. And she sinned. Ironically, because of the fall and its effect on man, what theologians refer to as the noetic effects of sin, <coughs> man cannot know anything as he ought to know it until he first embraces Christ and adopts a Christian world and life view. Scoffers demonstrate that they are unwilling, that they are willfully blind. They are willfully blind. They are slaves to Satan and their own sin. Now, like chapter 2, 
Here Peter adds a reason for these wicked apostates' mockery of Scripture. <clears throat> they proceed with their mockery according to their own lusts. They have the same unregenerate, polluted nature as the false teachers in chapter 2. You see, there's an organic connection between people who refuse to repent and people who have absurd, unbiblical views and believe in heresy. Men reject divine revelation and apostatize so they can live a life of sin and human autonomy. They go on to mock the word of God and Christianity to con uh, to confirm and support their decision to apostatize. Now, deep down, they know that they are guilty and under God's condemnation. And thus, they attempt to convince themselves of the absurdity of Christianity. Most of the people who are super anti-Christian today are people who were raised as Christian. Francis Schaeffer, for example, or Frankie Schaeffer. The guy's a wicked liberal apostate. The word walking, by the way, indicates that their lives are characterized by sinful behavior. <clears throat> they live to follow their own sinful desires, and they speak openly in support of their wicked behavior. They're just, their whole philosophy, their whole view is to support their lifestyle. Here's what Plummer says. And this is his commentary. This is uh, his commentary on Psalm 1. A man's walk is the course of his life. When the tenor of one's ways is like that of the wicked, he is wicked. Like Enoch, all the righteous walk with God. The counsel of the wicked is a term used to denote not merely his advice, but his aims, his maxims, his principles, his practices. In all these, saints and sinners are unlike. <coughs> The righteous hates the thought of sin, and so walks not with the impious. And then regarding the scornful, okay, this is a commentary on Psalm 1, he adds this. In Scripture, scorning expresses the indifference and hatred of the wicked toward divine things. <coughs> they condemn God. Nor is anything more expressive of the deadly malice of the wicked towards the righteous than the cruel mockings to which the latter are often exposed. The natural tendency of all sin is to lead to outbreaking and deadly despite towards all that is good. Proud and haughty scorner is the name of all who long resist divine calls and mercies. End of quote. Now, with that in mind, and what Peter has said in mind, just, just a brief side note of application. Can we have neutrality with such people? And the answer is no. Can we have peace with such people? The answer is no. Can we form a constitution based on neutrality where secular humanists are left in charge of the civil government and have peace over the long haul, over the long run? And the answer is absolutely not because they're covenant breakers and they're absolutely hostile to the Christian faith. And they're going to mock it, they're going to make laws against it, and they're going to persecute it. So once again, we see that there is no epistemological or ethical neutrality between the true Christian and the apostate or unbeliever. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break, trying to divide this up equally, and we're going to come back and we have a lot more to say about verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> you can see that Peter's message is extremely relevant to a modern audience. Things have not changed. In fact, mockery is in fashion, and it's very popular today, and it's the fad. It's what is done in Hollywood and the, ma the media against Christianity. So you, you ought to know about this. You ought to know why. We live in a culture that has rejected Christ, and they are trying to convince themselves that there is no final judgment, and to do so, they have to mock the Bible, they have to mock Jesus Christ, they have to mock God's people. And that is why sodomites and their allies are going to make sodomite laws and they're going to use those to persecute Christians because they hate us. They hate the word of God. They hate the Lord Jesus Christ. They hate God the Father. So let's not be foolish about this. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for your holy word. 
Peter's message is really amazing and fitting for our time. We ask you would ingrain it into our minds and our hearts that we would believe it and apply it to our lives so that we would be ready for the final judgment, that we would focus on it as a means of holiness, a means of spurring us to greater behavior and perseverance and sanctification. In Jesus' name, amen.